Hello everybody, this is Bruce from Printavo, Simple Shop Management Software. We've got a very special guest with us today, Kevin Baumgart from Hierology. He is the VP of BizDev over there. Um, Kevin, welcome to the show. Yeah, thanks for having me, Bruce. Appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. So Kevin, I brought on as a lot of shops are starting to bring on salespeople or want to try to focus or understand how sales can affect their business. And Kevin's got a ton of experience in that area. So I just wanted to really, you know, poke his brain on that so everyone can can learn from that. And he's not in the printing space, actually. So he's he's working at a startup. And you could tell us a little bit about that first. Yeah, happy to. So I, I work and run business development for a company called Hireology. We're a web-based, software service-based recruiting and hiring platform that's helping small businesses to better manage um, the way that they structure, source, acquire, and then select the right talent. So um, I've had a, a really interesting experience of starting at this organization early. There was three of us in a small hallway. We're now up to uh, 120 employees. Went through some rounds of venture capital financing. So I've been able to get a really, really close glimpse of, of our business growing from just a few of us to what, what we're at today. Very cool. And what did you start off there as? Was it on the sales side too? Yeah. So I was hired to really build out and structure the uh, the entire sales organization. Everything from defining our, our messaging and our pitch to um, hiring salespeople to creating compensation plans to figuring out our target market. Really everything that on the sales end, um, I was tasked with doing, which early on that included me cold calling, right? And supporting our customers, closing deals, running demos. So really all of the, the specific sales stuff, which that's obviously changed a lot as, as time has gone on and as our business has matured. Sure. Got it. Very cool. And how long ago was that when you started? So uh, five year, my five year anniversary was this month. Okay. Very cool. So yeah, so from you know three to 150 is definitely a huge leap. Um, talk about a little bit on the messaging. So when you first started, your goal is to really build out that that whole process. I mean, you have a complete blank slate. A lot of these shops are very similar, and they want to they, okay. they want to ramp up the sales side. And so you mentioned the messaging uh, and the pitch side, which it seems pretty foundational. Yeah, I think that that is. Um, as foundational as developing and, and building your sales process. So I, I think for, for us, and one thing that we did right was um, document the successes and the failures that we had. So defining the steps in the sales process that, that worked to then acquire, acquire customers and those steps that didn't work. Um, and, and part of that was messaging and, and, the, and the pitch. So through voicemail scripts, email scripts, um, demo scripts as we're running meetings with potential uh, potential clients. What are the things that that we say that resonate and that work well? And then how do we integrate that into the whole sales process and make sure that we're we're doing the right things um, to to bring those customers on? So it was a pretty critical part up front. Um, we also had had some help on that. So we hired a a consulting company that did some. Um, appointment and lead generation for us and part of their services was to get a really good understanding of our business and how we helped our clients so they actually did do some of their own messaging uh, creation so that the folks on their team that were calling on our behalf to schedule meetings um, had a good understanding and, and talk track that they could follow as well so it was a combination of, of us creating ourselves and them as an appointment setting service that we needed um, helping to create that as well. So is that more of a lead gen sending you potential leads or is it actually helping you develop the scripts, the, me the, the, you know, the, the messaging and, and what you wanted to say to customers? Yeah. So they called themselves um, a door opening service. So they were actually setting the meetings for us. So at that time I probably had a sales organization of eight or nine people. And we, we realized that speed to market was really important for us. So we found a specific niche of the market that we wanted to target. <clears throat> and we felt that adding, adding a appointment setting service to the structure that we had created would mm -hmm. help us get there faster. Mm -hmm. And part of their service on the front end was to help us create that uh, more structured messaging and pitch than what we already had, had defined. Yeah, so that's interesting, picking the niche 
and really going as fast as possible into the niche and using them to help expand that pretty quickly. So those first few people, um, so you, that that that's you skip to eight people. What about the first hire? Um, walk me through where did you look to find that person? You know, obviously them setting it up. What type of person would even be interested in something where it's like it's just them, or you and him? Or yeah, her? yeah. So, so um, I realized pretty quickly as as we as I started in all of the roles of the sales process, cold calling, scheduling meetings. Uh, running meetings, supporting our customers that were on the platform, I, I was spread thin pretty quickly. So, um, and I found myself really just working on the easy stuff, right? Running meetings and supporting customers. That's way easier than picking up the phone, cold calling, right? So I realized that we needed to have some support on that front end. So the first uh, sales hire that we made outside of myself was was someone doing just that, you know, making 80 to 100 phone calls a day and scheduling additional meetings for me to run. Um, we uh, that person had a couple years of sales experience, and I think the reason why they joined our organization is, you know, we had a, a pretty interesting story to tell. High potential, you know, high growth startup. Even in the short time that I was there, um, they had an opportunity to get in at the ground floor and help us really grow and expand the business. Um, that person is still there today. The first hire that I made, he runs our uh, our franchise business team, our franchise sales team. So. Um, yeah, those those early hires were really critical, um, and I think we realized really quickly where there was gaps. Like we didn't have someone focused on supporting the customers that were on the platform. We needed to hire someone and really build out the structure and the process on that end. Same thing with me with that first hire, figuring out that we needed someone that could really focus on cold calling and that inside business development and scheduling meetings for us. Gotcha. Where did you really specifically find them? Was it a friend recommendation or? So, I mean, <clears throat> since we're recruiting and hiring platform, I have a little bit of a luxury of, of better managing that because it's our business, yeah. right? Um, but we utilize a number of sources. Um, job boards are still a necessary evil. So um, sites like Indeed, Indeed is the largest job board aggregator in the U.S. They have over 110 million unique visitors a month. So um, Indeed helped. Uh, our internal social media, so having all of us post all of our internal social media channels mm -hmm. um, that we're hiring for a specific role. We also structured an employee referral program so that if any of us did help to find a candidate, um, we would be compensated in some way for that. Um, and then really building out uh, uh, our career brand. So even though we were a small business and didn't have a lot of experience with helping employees to grow, we're able to tell a story on our, on our company website and showcase why we're an employer of choice and why people should want to work there. Again, and the, the, the selling opportunity for us early on and still kind of that is get in early um, at a high growth startup opportunity to grow in advance. Um, th that was really our message and the way that we helped to attract people into the business. Got it. And the so finding the person usually salespeople are commission based um it's kind of hard to figure out how commission works for different types of businesses but what what types a lot of these shops are are they might bring in a sale of you know a couple thousand dollars a couple hundred dollars up to 10 you know twenty thousand dollars or more okay. um and it could be one time or over and over what tips do you have for helping to create a sort of plan that's beneficial for them to help them and motivate them, but also helps the business to grow too? Sure. So I think what we commission and comp plans can get really difficult and mm -hmm. it, it's hard to structure. Um, a couple of things that I did, I just, I leveraged my network and talked to as many people as I could as to how they structure comp plans. So I talked to a lot of people um, even um, our vendors, so like our CRM provider, which was salesforce.com, I talked to their compensation expert to really understand how they paid their salespeople and how they compensated them overall. Um, I think the biggest thing that I learned was that you want to really compensate for the behaviors that you want to see. So if I want someone cold calling and, and setting meetings, um, I want to compensate them for getting those meetings set and held, right? If, if I'm 
if I want an account executive that's actually going to close the business and bring and compensate them, commission them on getting that revenue in the door. Um, and then you just have to make sure that it's structured, that it fits for your business. So how, what portion of the, the sale can be provided in commission that it still makes sense for our business, but that it's still lucrative for that salesperson. Um, and there's, there's a pretty easy model to, to work, work that out. But I think just underlying the most important thing is incentivize and motivate people according to the behaviors that, that you know that they need to do to be successful in their job. Got it. So really write out kind of the sales process that you're looking for them to do and then maybe tackle those different pieces and, and create a structure. And, and, it, and the more that your business is, is metriced, the easier that gets, right? Mm-hmm. So you've got your sales process set and defined and you know the behaviors that are going to drive an increase in business and drive revenue to the organization. The more that we can metric each of those steps in the process, like the number of calls that are made equal to the number of appointments that are set, the number of new opportunity appointments that are, are held, sure. right? Not all the ones that get set hold. So those that hold, um, our closing ratio is X percent typically. Our average deal size is X. The more that we can metric all those pieces in the business, th- the better off we're going to be in, and be able to focus on here's how we should compensate and commission those folks based on what they do. Got it. So really getting as analytical as possible around the whole flow, the sales flow that they're going through. Um, and, but, and early on, that's difficult because right, there's not a lot of tools say, technology yeah. in place. Um, a business like ours now, we have such a structured organization behind our CRM, which is salesforce.com. It's, re- it's really our ER, it's like an our ERP. It runs our business from a back end perspective. We have a ton of reporting and data and analytics out of that now. Early on, we didn't have any of that. So early on, we relied on really, you know, Google Sheets, right? Yeah. We just yeah. had shared Google Docs where Which is we would. a great way to start it. Yeah, we, we would organize everything in one place. It was um, incredibly monotonous and time consuming, um, but it was still a, a necessity to be able to metric the, um, the behaviors and the impact that our team members were having and making sure that we were aligning compensation and everything else to that. Did you iterate on it relatively often or did you kind of set it, wait a couple months and see how that worked? Like comp plans and commission yeah. structures yeah. and all that? All, all We iterated it nonstop. So our, our business shifted and changed so much that we had to. And I, I think my CEO instilled this in me that, you know, there's a lot of unknowns here. And in a business like ours, we have to all be able to thrive in, in ambiguity and be able to work on our feet. And it's always going to change. So he made me the promise when I started that. The only thing that I'll promise to you from a comp plan perspective is that we're going to screw this up, but we'll make it right. Sure. So at about once a quarter, we would reiterate and look at comp plans and just make sure that it made the most sense for our employees and for the business overall. Okay. And, our, and our employees knew that, that that comp was going to be looked at on a quarterly basis, and it still is today. Um, quotas, compensation, plan, they're always changing and updating just based on, based on our business. Got and it. if, and if you're open and, uh, you've got that transparency up front, it makes it that much easier. And from a, anything commission comp perspective, the more you can communicate it, the better. So if there is going to be comp changes, let them know that it's coming up, have the conversation around why they're changing reiterate again uh, a week after here's why it changed do you have any questions the more that we can communicate that the better um, there's nothing that would upset an employee more than getting comp plans changed without really giving them insight as to why yeah so keeping that as transparent as you can for sure um i skipped over one big one which is how to hire them or and and going through that interview process I'm sure as everyone is is worked to hire their first couple people and beyond, you know, there's a lot of different candidates that may be out there, but it might be hard to find the right one or the good fit or someone that that you can really depend on. What are some tips or things that you've gone through, or maybe so more so your methodology of, sorry, knowing when this is the right person, keep pushing them through in that whole flow. Okay. Yeah. So I, I think with, with most parts of our business, the more process driven and structured it is, the easier it is. Uh-huh. So 
found that, that most small businesses don't have a prescriptive approach that they follow to recruiting and hiring the right talent. So I think for us, the reason why our turnover is so low, why we've been able to grow the business as fast as we have and how we were able to make good hires is that we've always followed a really structured approach. So that starts with sourcing, right? Getting the word out there about the job in as many places as possible. We do a really simple pre-screen on the front end. So we ask each of the candidates just a number of true and false questions about their past work experience. Um, obviously, it's automated through our technology, through Hireology. So we make that really easy to not have to look at every single candidate's resume and application because we're pre-screening them on the front end and only looking at those candidates that score highest. From there, then, we run a really, really structured and systemized interview process that starts with a phone interview and then goes through in-person interviews. All of the the scripts for the interview guides, the questions that we're asking, as well as the answers that we should be looking for are documented. So as a hiring manager, I don't have to guess what I should be asking and what I should want to hear. All of that's structured out and there's a scoring component behind that. Really? So, okay. and, and, and that's, it's, re, it's really not that difficult to do. Just think about the behaviors that you want that person to have. So for salespeople, you want them to be persistent. You want them to be able to build trust. You want them to be competitive. And then think about questions that align to those behaviors. So tell me about a time when you needed to be persistent. Why, why did you need to be persistent? What was the outcome? What happened? So, so now I'm really, instead of just having a high-level conversation and asking them about what they did, I'm now really learning about do they exude the behaviors that are critical for success in the role that I'm hiring for. So in the beginning, maybe profiling each of the jobs that we're looking for and really understanding and, and listing out the behaviors that are needed for success in the job is pretty critical too. But then from the interview process, we then do some personality-based profiling and skill-based assessments. And then the obvious verification services, background checks, drug screens, those things. So we know when we have a good fit because they've outperformed all of the other candidates in all these steps. There's not, I, would, I wouldn't say there's one silver bullet that we can look at to say, all right, I've hired the right person because they scored X on this assessment or because they did well in this interview. For us, it's let's look at the, the whole process holistically and make the best decision based on, on uh, the per person that, that achieved the most in the whole entire process, not just one step. What are some, uh, so early on though, I mean, th did you have that, you know, that some of those tools, cause it, you know, especially a, a tool to, to maybe, I guess I don't know of, of different tools that, that a smaller medium sized business can use to help analyze their personality and things, or are there simple questions or things that you guys use early on to help gauge that? Again, we, we kind of had the luxury of being a recruiting and hiring platform that's built into Hireology. Gotcha, so you have so, the tool so you built. We had it, we had it. Um, that said, small businesses, there is a lot of technologies out there that can, that can help them profile jobs and help them create interview questions around that. A lot of even personality or behavioral-based assessments um, based on a job description can then help you create behavioral based interview questions on it as well. So there is a number of resources out there that, that can help, um, even small businesses to organize that part of the hiring process. Okay, cool. Um, and so, uh, you know, going through, so you essentially score them and create like a very distance. So it's not like a, Oh, well, I really like this person and, and that, uh, someone else is like, Oh, I didn't really like them. It's very, um, you know, numerical. Uh, yeah, numerical. It's, it's, it's objective, right? right. So, and, the, and you brought up a good point, Bruce. When I, before I started at Hireology, when I, I would hire salespeople, I'd hire people that I liked or people that were like me or people that I would have a beer with, you know, like sure. th that was my hiring criteria. Yeah. Um, that is 100% shifted now away from that subjective decision to now a very objective data-driven decision on hiring the people that have the behaviors needed for success in that job. And have you seen, I'm assuming you've seen better success with less turnover and better quality candidates doing that versus trying to mimic you? Way more, way more. So I, I, I'd get it right about half the time. You know, I'd hire um, a guy or gal 
and think that they'd be great. And then three months later they left or we had to let them go. And I would be like, why didn't they fit? And I think it be that hierology is open my eyes to, we really need a prescriptive way to recruit and hire talent aligned to the behaviors that are needed for the job. So yeah, our, our hit rate, our turnover rate is way better now than it's it, for salespeople than it's ever been early on in my career. Got it. Very interesting. Um, so what about mistakes? Whether using your process, um, what are some some gotchas that you found out didn't work out very well that you've kind of tailored? Regards to recruiting and hiring? Yeah, and more currently now too with, with the more subjective process. Was there some things, because I remember reading an article too about Google and how they would ask these crazy questions. Um, and I remember too, years ago when I was uh, chatting with them as well, it was a lot more questions driven around like the ping pong balls in the airplane, like how many could fill it up to see, you know, where you're at and how you think through the problem. But they didn't find any sort of actual data that showed that that was bringing in a better candidate going through those types yeah. of questions. <clears throat> no correlation to on the job success and performance. Right. Yeah. Um, so I think, some of the mistakes that we made even with this more structured and rigorous approach, one, one was if we were in a hurry, maybe skipping steps and not following the process holistically. Um, it happened, and typically the result wasn't what we wanted. So I think it, it helped us to understand and, and open our eyes to even if we were in a hurry and wanted someone in quickly, we still needed to follow the process. Yeah. And, and what I just described is typically takes us about two to three weeks um, that said, if we need to compress it into a week, we can, we just got to make sure schedules align and, and we're a little bit more on top of getting the process completed. So I also think that especially when you're hiring salespeople, you have to act fast in a startup where I'm at, you, we can't do anything slow. We we're always moving quickly. And I think, you know, for, for the, the print shop folks that are listening, good salespeople aren't on the job market long. So if you find someone that could be a right fit, you got to be willing to make a decision pretty quickly. But my recommendation would be to not sacrifice steps in the process and sure. make sure that we're following the right approach. Sure. We're just doing it efficiently. Got it. I'm actually just writing uh, some of this down too because I want to put it on. I mean, that's a really good point. I actually listened to another uh, speaker talk and he was saying, you know, especially very good salespeople, they're not just going to come walking through the door either. Um, right. He's like, you know, the top people you really have to seek after or, or find or, yeah, they're going to be snatched up pretty quickly. Yep. So salespeople are, are really hard to hire overall. Um, two, two things to keep in mind. One, even mediocre salespeople are really, really good at selling themselves. Right? Right. So I'm not a stellar salesperson, but I know me more than anyone. I can sell me pretty easily. So that's why it's even more important to have a really structured interview process that asks behavioral based questions about what they've done in the past. Mm -hmm. um, and the other thing to keep in mind too, salespeople are a product of their environment. And what I mean by that is if I was a successful salesperson at let's say Microsoft, Google, LinkedIn, Salesforce, name a large organization that has a lot of support and structure. Um, I've got a lot of marketing collateral. I've got a lot of, um, backing support, sales engineers. I've got a, a lot of support in those big organizations. If I was a successful salesperson at one of those organizations, that doesn't mean that I'm going to be successful at a small print shop with not a lot of direction and, and marketing background and all those things that, that would make me successful. So we got to think about where what their environment was like and the support that they had in those roles. Is there certain characteristics that you can see that help people know that they're going to be more successful in one like a smaller less organized type of business versus a a larger one i don't know if there's anything specific i think that individuals should be able to tell you that and their resume and their past experience should prove that as well okay so i would just i would ask them and be really transparent we don't have a ton of marketing support we don't have a huge name in the market not a lot of people are going to know you when you're reaching out it, have you worked in other organizations where that was the case? And did you perform and excel well in those areas? 
So just really trying to get a feel for what they've done in the past and what they're looking for too. Is that something that they want to take on? Yeah. Yeah. We actually, we do the same. We literally just ask and say, you know, we're, we're a growing business, very unstructured, but we depend on you to own your area. Is that something you're comfortable? And some people do that. That's a big thing. And they'll just be like, you know, I'm looking for something with more structure. Um, sure. And it's like, well, great. You know, and I'm glad I asked that now versus figuring that out later. Oh, that internet skipping. But um, yeah, so let's talk about now training. So we, we you you picked the person, you brought them on. How do you get them acquainted? And what it applies to is, especially in these print shops, there's a lot of things going on. If you bring in someone from outside the industry, there's maybe 15, 20 steps that, that goes through just to, you know, create a promotional product or a, a shirt or a sign or anything like that. What do you put them through what are the expectations that you have with bringing someone on time wise and setting goals and things like that so every, every business is obviously different and the ramp time is going to be is going to be different based on the technicality of the sales process and and ramping up and learning about the business mm-hmm. uh, my recommendation here is is create uh, what we call 30 60 and 90 day plans so this starts in the interview process with the candidate. So we together collaboratively, it's, it's the onus is on the candidate, but we help them with it is to create a plan to show what success looks like 30, 60 and 90 days in. And they typically will then present that plan on the completion of the interview process. Um, and that, then it's tweaked again, collaboratively between us and the candidate, uh, before they're hired. And then, so as they're brought on and, and we're running through orientation and onboarding, we're reiterating that plan. They're making tweaks and changes to it if they and we see fit. And then we're checking in at least once a week on where they're at to plan. After 30 days, do we check off all the, within 30 days, here's what we want to achieve, the goals and objectives. Same thing with 60, same thing with 90. Um, we found that following a, a structured approach like that can really help them and, and help us to make sure that we're all on the same page and expectations sure. are met. One, one funny thing that we'll also find is that as candidates are starting to create that plan, a lot of times they'll self-select themselves out of the process. You know, they're thinking, wow, this is a lot of work. I don't know if I'm cut out for this. I'm going to bow out. I'm done, you know? And we want to know that now versus once we start through the onboarding and training process and then, then they realize that this is too much and we've got to go through that whole process again. We want to learn that as early as possible. And by building and creating those plans in the interview process, we've we found that it's the right timing and will help them hit those goals earlier on. Got it. Yeah. Very cool. Um, so those are some good this is a lot of really good lessons. I really appreciate helping me out and and, and you know, providing all this knowledge from your side. And even our, though they're not, you know, a, a printing business and a, a startup or def, a software startup or different things, but there's a lot of commonalities, especially on the hiring side. Um, give me one last tip that anything that you've learned, some sales related that someone could take and and say, okay, this is perfect. So they don't make the same mistake. Uh, one, one thing that I always bring up that, that came to mind as, as, as you asked that question was we early on in our business had less structure and organization as to who our target client was. So we didn't have a lot of, we were targeting small and mid-sized businesses. That was our, that was our core target market, which that's not a target market. That's like 95% of all businesses yeah, in the U.S. Right. And, and I think we, we really quickly realized that we needed to find a niche in the market and we needed to find a specific type of company and a subset of that market where we could really focus our energy and efforts to. Uh, and what we found is that, so, so then we spent, we spread ourselves thin and looked at a lot of different markets and took a lot of research and data back in and said, all right, here's the market that we think is the best fit for our business. Um, what we were able to do then once we had a really specific uh, target market to focus on is put all of our efforts to that market and all of our expertise, all of our case studies, testimonials, white papers were for that market. We were, were now looked at as, as subject matter experts for recruiting and hiring for that market. All of our marketing dollars go into those trade shows and, and conventions, those associations, 
it's really, really changed our business. And uh, the mistake that we made is just not figuring out that market earlier and putting all that focus and emphasis on that market when we, when we should have it took yeah. us a little bit longer to, to figure that out. Got it. So really get very specific as the type of people you're trying to target and go after it. The type of businesses, the type of contacts, the more specialized you can get, the better your message is going to be, the better customer testimonials are, the easier it's going to be to get in front of them and earn their business because you know their business. You're already working with a ton of their competitors, et cetera. Perfect. Awesome. Well, I really appreciate it, Kevin. Is there any book or, or person you're following right now or reading through? Um, early on in at Hireology, I read a book called Predictable Revenue. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it's so I read it five years ago. It's a little dated now, but it still has a lot of really great knowledge um, and and information on how to structure an inside sales team. So if if there's folks out there that are looking to hire their first salespeople and figure out how to attract and acquire more business and really how to warm up that cold call that we all uh, hate and have appreh- apprehension towards. Yeah. Um, uh, a book called Predictable Revenue, the author is Aaron Ross, was a, a great book that I'm really glad that I read early on that we put a lot of our, our sales team structure and a lot of our initial cold call and outreach structure around. Got it. Awesome. Well, Kevin, thank you again. I appreciate the time. I know you're a busy guy. and um, Well, let's see. It's almost Thursday. So, yeah, I hope you have a great rest of the week. Yeah, thanks, Bruce. Appreciate it. See you. All right, bye. Bye Bye-bye.